What's up, everybody? It's Keefe from GhostCultMag.com, and I'm here with the original Wicked Woman of Heavy Metal, Jinx Dawson of Coven. Hails. And yeah. hails to you. And hails to you as well. Thank Welcome. You so much. We are here in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, lucky and blessed to be spending some time with Jinx today, uh, reflecting on her career, hopefully, and talking about all the exciting and interesting things that she has done and will do in the future. Oh, boy. And that's a lot, too. <laughs> Uh, there won't be time for all that stuff. Probably not all of it, but maybe <laughs> some some cool things. We'll, we'll pick on certain points in history. Um, have been a big fan of yours most of my life. Uh, any of my introductions to heavy music, I was uh, fortunate enough to be introduced to Coven and your music. Uh, 2019 is a significant anniversary for you. More yes. than 50 years in the business. Half a century. Half a century, 50 years from the debut album. Uh, I just wanted to kind of talk first off and foremost about just kind of, you know, history. Coven has had a huge resurgence the last few years where I feel like people have caught up to Coven. Yes. Not that Coven had to ever catch up to anybody else. Uh, yes. And so how do you sort of, where are you, how are your feelings now looking back on this entire career? Oh. Well, it's pretty strange because it kind of starts, stops, starts, stops, and then it starts again, and I'm just here for the ride, so take me wherever you want me, people. Nice. Uh, so interestingly, I, I strangely enough, I think before I ever heard a, a Coven proper album, I, I definitely had seen the film Billy Jack, and I know the theme song, and what you know is really interesting is normally in the old school music industry way, uh, a band record, you know, records a song, not theirs. They make it their own. It becomes a hit. This song, particularly one tin soldier, the theme song to Billy Jack was a huge hit single, uh, not clearly your design, but a hit single. Nonetheless, a great performance, a memorable one. And then stirred through kismet, you get to sort of, you know, craft your own career and create your own sound and style. Um, it's kind of funny. Do people still come up and talk to you only about the song and don't really know Coven too well? It, at first they did, like, say, 10 years ago. They they kept doing that, and they really didn't know about the witchcraft albums or anything like that. But you know what? Now it's funny. They know about that, and they know about One Tin Soldier, but then now they're kind of changing what they think about One Tin Soldier, which is interesting because if you notice, like, some of the words are, uh, go ahead and hate your neighbor, go ahead and cheat a friend. And they kind of thought, they were doing it at like summer camps and things like that. But when they listen to the words, that's a little left-hand path there, you know? Well, that's uh, very well said. I think in context now of the rest of your career and what followed, clearly the song has a different connotation when you, you know, factor in the future Jinx yeah, Dawson exactly. and, and Coven music, but exactly. it takes on a different shape. I know mm -hmm. several people, I was looking at YouTube comments, which you should never look at YouTube comments, everybody, but I was looking at the YouTube comments. This song is so uplifting and it's so anti-war and it's so positive and it's got a really good hidden message. It's got hidden messages. All right. When you think <laughs> about right. it, um, but, and the movie was, you know, uh, you know, also a little subversive too. So uh, I know sort of culturally at that time, you know, it was like a very interesting, you know, fortuitous turn at the start of your career. Right. Exactly. Well, it, it, other people were doing it after we did it too. Like a friend of mine shared, shared did it on the show because we were booked to be on the show, but for legal reasons, our manager pulled, pulled us at the last minute and they ended up doing a cartoon and Cher sang it, but they did a cartoon. And if you notice in the cartoon, the soldiers going up the hill were Templars. So see, it all kind of ties mm. in in a very strange way. It all comes back to Crowley, doesn't it? Uh, well, it kind of all comes back to Coven too. It does. <laughs> it does. And before we go back to Coven and talk a little bit about the first album and the <clears throat> anniversary of the first album, I do want to add one more thing to the sort of one tin soldier uh, thing is a few years later after Coven hits and the record comes out, you ended up on American Bandstand, which is right. part of my childhood. And I think a lot of Americans of a certain age remember Dick Clark and American Bandstand is like, this is where we catch whatever's on the radio. And again, this was a huge hit single. For three different years. Yeah. For several, you know, uh, yeah. 60, se 71, 72 and 73. Right. It was like top, you know, top 20. And up. I mean, it did get to 17 until the attorneys pulled it down management. Mm. So. Was that a was that a very surreal thing to be on television uh, playing that song after you had already had the Coven record out? 
No, it wasn't too bad because actually we were really friends with Dick Clark. I mean, I, I had pictures later with him, you know, visiting me. Um, so I really liked the man and, you know, he, he kind of knew about the other stuff, but, um, no, I kind of liked it when I looked back, I, I actually have been trying to find that footage, but I understand that it burnt or something in a fire or they covered it up. I mean, I heard some kind of stories. Well, they used to cover up tapes, um, that they didn't think were like Elvis or something, you know, they used to re do the shows on the tape. So something happened, either that or a fire. So if you ever find it, let me know. Okay. I'd like to see it again. All right. You can uh, find that at Jinx's website, um, a contact info, yes. but uh, yeah, that's, yeah. Dick Clark always uh, amazed me and interested me and fascinated me in American music television programs in general. I find them to be very fascinating of a certain era, but Coven, uh, so Coven, uh, you know, is formed after this period where you record this song and the Coven album is groundbreaking. It's amazing. Uh, it's kind of hard to believe that it's been this long, but it has had kind of a power, a staying power. And I I, uh, I wanted to kind of touch on that first and foremost about the debut Coven album. Okay. Um, d- it is odd because it was, it was banned um, – Everywhere, pretty much. At first, uh, they were selling it under counters or, you know, with a brown paper bag over it. But then finally, it was totally banned and taken out of definitely the big box stores. They wouldn't allow it. Then even after that album, they wouldn't allow any Coven um, albums, you know. And I'm kind of surprised that the one Tin Soldier slipped through. But um, I think the Internet, obviously, people kind of like wondered, well, what happened to that? Or how did this all begin? you know, goth music, heavy metal, doom metal, whatever you want to call it. Um, so they kept kind of going back and then Coven was right there sort of at the end, you know, with the cult lyrics and, um, uh, the, the, the presentations and everything. So, and they kept trying to go back farther and they still, it's so funny on the internet, they try to go back farther and farther, but it's not working. <laughs> and right. the, they'll put a date in there and it's the wrong date or, you know, they'll Photoshop the picture of a sign of the horns and it's not, you know, legit. But, um, so that's quite complimentary and I, you know, I'm, I guess I'm glad to have that, you know, in my story. Um, and I just wish people would, uh, you know, want to know that, you know, you want the facts. So you don't really want, I know some people were angry about it. Like fans of Dio, we were friends with Dio. We were friends with Kiss, the guys in Kiss, Gene Simmons. Um, actually we played one of our first shows with, um, when we were in LA with Black Sabbath because Alice Cooper was supposed to be on the show and he couldn't do that day. So we did a show with Black Sabbath and the two Ozzy Osbournes met. <laughs> it was kind of interesting, you know. But um, so it's kind of nice to have people go back and see the history and say, yeah, that's really was true. It wasn't PR or anything like that. It was just what it was. And, you know, if, if your childhood is dashed because you didn't think Dio did the sign of the horns first, I... I feel bad about it, but you know what I'm saying? Well, even in his uh, final mm-hmm. interviews, he was very frank about not being, he's like, clearly I didn't invent this thing and I was copying someone else, but right. he, I definitely helped popularize it. Right. They definitely saw you do it he first. Did. Well, we were friends with Ronnie mm-hmm. because we used to go to the Rainbow Bar and Grill. And um, when Ronnie was forming the band Rainbow, we even told him, uh, we said, you really want to call your band after a bar and grill on Sunset Strip? And he goes, yeah, I do. And and I'm saying, oh, but Ron, you'll never make it with that name, you know? So, hey, what did I know at that point? You know, I mean, people didn't know unless they lived in LA and went down on Sunset Strip that there was a, in fact, a very famous, you know, bar called the Rainbow and there was no internet then. And so it sounded pretty good. And so that's where he saw us do the sign of the horns and I know the Mono Cornuto is very similar, and he's, I'm sure his grandmother did it. You know, this is it. You point and po- poke out the eyeballs, but the sign of the horns is up, and it's got like that. It's right. not like that. No. So, tis what it is. Indeed. And even in the very first review of Coven, I know he was much more of a punk fan than a heavy metal guy, but Lester Banks called, Lester Bangs called, 
coven, the American, you know, Black Sabbath, the British coven. Right, the British coven. Let me get yeah. that correct. So that's correct. Uh, the that British is correct. coven is that's what Black correct. Sabbath was called. The very first track on yep. the debut album is Black Sabbath. Yeah. Uh, there were definitely similarities. Did you ever feel, just thinking back on it and reflecting back, um, not slighted, but was it either, you know, sort of alternating between flattery and annoyance? Probably that, definitely. But I figured it was probably just fate and it was not my path to do it that way because I always did uh, the witchcraft album as a scholarly work. So I wasn't into getting rich because my family already had money. I had money, so I didn't need that. I wasn't into being like some kind of famous superstar. I didn't care about that because I'd been in opera and you don't really, you, there are some, but you don't really go there like a, a rock artist does. And so none of that interested me. So it, it really didn't do that, bother me. Um, but it is kind of strange that nobody really wanted to talk about it for the longest time and they're still not really talking about it. And, you know, usually you'll see bands, the first thing you see on a band's bio, who are they influenced by, mm. you know? And it's like all these people, like, you know, they'll say something really odd, like Deep Purple, which that's cool because I used to go out with John Lord of Deep Purple. But they'll say some really like Janis Joplin or something, and it has nothing to do with what they do, you know? And I'm kind of like, well, are you avoiding the subject or are you just – picking artists that are dead so you know so they won't come around and mess you up or what you know so mm. it is kind of interesting you know because you know if i take something from somebody i'm going to definitely give them credit especially if i'm asked i don't have to like offer it but i'm definitely going to you know say yes i did know them you know Right on. I think as a journalist and a person that is uh, bombarded by publicists every day, I definitely feel you on that sentiment. And I think it's just a, I think a happening of bands is they're sort of uh, groomed and coached into saying like, you're supposed to say cool bands are my influence. Right. And, uh, and certainly Janice is, you know, Janice Joplin's wonderful. And I'm glad you mentioned your background in opera and other things, because one of the things that really stands out to me and stands the test of time for me for your music is the vocals. As much as people talk, you know, Coven is magnificent, uh, like you said, scholarly, well-researched, wonderful lyrics, amazing ceremony, and the style and the visual aspect. But to me, I find vocal the vocals are the thing that keeps me coming back as much wow, as anything. thank you. That's quite and, a compliment. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And I think for the time that you came up as a singer, you're, you know, your very first few you know, projects as a singer of the time, most singers were just copying and aping either sort of blues and soul. Right. That's true. Or, you know, whoever was big at the moment, Grace Slick, Janis Joplin, wonderful right. singers, amazing people. Um, but you really had a quality about your voice, not just the tone of your voice, but how you phrase things almost like a jazz singer. And there's some moments in witchcraft that are very jazzy and uh, interesting. Well, I did sing jazz yeah, I figured there's, <laughs> with a jazz band in Florida for a while yeah, when so, I was really when about 14. Yeah. Yeah. So that stuff is all in there. And I think it's, uh, you know, uncommon for the time, which also gave it like a very, you know, beyond just being spooky or soulful or, you know, frying your voice a little bit for some raspy soul and blues. I think there's other things going on there oh, that really, you know, you. make the music stand the test of time. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, and I wanted to, you know, further on that, like, so who, beside your very, you know, at a young age, you had a, a sort of a very vast experience with singing. Uh, who were some of the singers or musicians or artists you liked growing up that sort of formed the young jinx? Mostly classical music was my background and opera. Um, but there, there were some, um, this sounds kind of odd, but Broadway, you might not know who this is, Ethel Merman. Sure. Have you ever heard of Ethel of Merman? Because she was a belter. Yeah. And I've always kind of been a belter, mm -hmm. you know, and kind of spoken sometimes instead of sing-songy, which opera is more sing-songy, but I guess I kind of shied away from that a little bit and wanted to belt out the words and get it across. So maybe her um, more than anybody that I can think of. I, did, I see I see that though. I can do definitely you? Yeah, uh -oh. I do. And I was a theater I was a theater uh -oh. kid, so every little theater kid has to learn there's no business like show business. Right, which exactly. is only her most famous song, but certainly not everything about her. <laughs> she was wonderful. Um there's a whole bunch. But yeah, I'm glad you shared that because I think that's one of the things that kind of lasts for me. And I feel like some of the followers of Coven 
not the peers, but the future imitators and followers and, you know, people who are great and inspired by the band don't have. They don't have that element. They have a very, I'm a cult rock and heavy metal and very just straight up pentatonic blues scale. Right. And, uh, and I think it's missing. So I think they don't have that little panache and that little flavor that you brought in on the very first album, the very first thing you ever did really besides. That's good. Plus I did like, you know, like some of the blues too, also crossroads, that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, we weren't really allowed to play rock and roll much in the house. uh, And there really wasn't much at that point. I mean, we kind of had, there was kind of the Carnaby thing going on and the Beatles, the beginning of the Beatles and, um, and Mary, I'm faithful, but beyond that, I started at that point. So there really wasn't a lot to pull from Elvis Presley, of course, Mm. um, which unfortunately I was supposed to record jailhouse rock, which was on the second album. Mm. Uh, he actually called me on the phone. And I thought it was a joke and I didn't know it was him. I thought it was like one of my friends going, Hey, Jinx, how are you? You know, and I'm like, <laughs> I said, come on, quit it, quit it, quit it. He goes, no, this is really ill. And I was like, no, it's not. And, um, I, f- I found out after the conversation kept going because the, uh, the Colonel got on the phone and he wanted to do a video with him singing with me, jailhouse rock, because he heard it on the record. Cause actually he had heard one tin soldier and thought it was a, Thought it was kind of a Christian record too, <laughs> you know. So As he was gonna do. he was gonna you tell do. me. So Wenton Soldier got that phone call, but then after that, he he died pretty quickly after that before we could even do that. But um, uh, my road manager at the time, he ended up doing a lot of work with uh, the Colonel. So it's kind of funny, but yeah, strange, strange world, you know. Mm, that's amazing. Uh, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, the second record because Blood on the Snow is the other, out, you know, I think the other work that people really know well. Uh, it's also had kind of its own little life, but it was definitely a tough period because you had had this sort of infamy almost and then right. stamped out a little bit by whether, right. you know, and you can elaborate if it was religious organizations, the industry Men in the business. Just about everything everything that you just said. Yeah, I mean, you know, it comes back to the thing where the women are griping about stuff now, the Me Too hashtag thing and all that, that they're not getting fair play. And I've had several interviews with women wanting to focus on that. And, you know, I had not really thought about that before so much, even though I knew it was like a lot of man kind of stuff, you know, against women. I knew that um, they did want, uh, they didn't want a woman really, they thought it was bad to do occult stuff. But they knew, they knew there was a sales point there. They knew they were going to sell records. So, um, so yeah, now that I look at it, yeah, that, I mean, that was a big thing. So maybe that's good that I finally realized that and did those interviews and say something about it, I guess, you know, and maybe we're evening out because look at all the girls singing now and everything, girl bands, they're all over the place. Do you, uh, favor or like any of them or do you uh, like any of the coven lights that are out there? (laughs) Actually, I know quite a few. (laughs) They're my Facebook friends and then I've met them on the road too while they're playing and you know, they're, I gotta, I gotta like them, you know, because they're just nice people. And I mean, I don't think they, I think it's kind of like, what do they say? It's not something you get mad at, but it's, um, it's a compliment, you know, to do that. So that's the way I try to look at it. Cool. Uh, I, I, I often wonder about that. If, uh, you're either bemused by all of these sort of followers and credit getters. Uh, but, uh, it seems like you have a really great perspective on it, which is nice. Well, I didn't for a little while, but well, I could understand that. I think anybody could understand <laughs> I that. I came around and thought, okay, you know, it's cool. Right on. Uh, and so again, this magnificent debut happens and then blood on the snow. And then like you said, periods of inactivity, uh, verse or just things in your way, obstacles in the way of a future, uh, you know, wider success. Cause I think about even other bands, Lucifer's friend is a band. People always name check when they talk about Sabbath, you know, followers and things like that. And I'm like, why not Coven? Why is Coven not a bit, you know, a, a now I think the, everybody is catching up, as I said, uh, which is great. Um, was there a period of time there where you thought like maybe Coven was done and you weren't going to do Oh yeah. Anymore. Oh yeah. Because like I said, it was not my path to necessarily, oh, I'm going to be a big rock star. It wasn't anything like that. It was more information for people that were interested in it. And I thought the audience would be very small, which it was pretty small at the beginning, but then obviously other people saw that it could be big and they jumped on the bandwagon. 
Um, but when I, when it was really like, uh, at a low point just before the internet, um, I did kind of feel like I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing and I, what my path was. Mm. So I just kind of waited around until, you know, I hit the right road and just went with it. I mean, I'm just here for the ride now. I mean, come and ride with me. Come on people. Buy the ticket, take the ride, right? That's right. Awesome. Uh, I definitely uh, appreciate that the journey you've been on, and uh, I think the fans do too. And I think it's the reason why there's been a resurgence now. And I think part of that, in addition to other things that I talked about, I think the one of uh, uh, a real lasting thing that people are grabbing onto now is philosophy. You know, it's very. There are a lot of bands that are very spooky and evil and scary and talk about the devil, but. What I really loved about Coven songs and Coven lyrics uh, and your sort of portrayal live in particular, your live performances is that it's not so on the nose. It's sometimes very esoteric and obtuse and made you think and made you actually dig into the content and the lyrics, not just, oh, I may have heard that in church once. Isn't that clever? But an actual really deep meaning of things. And I wanted to talk to you about uh, philosophy a little bit and, uh, you know, it's meaningful to you. This is not a gag or, or a gimmick. Right, no. Like I know that people, it was probably mm. hard to get people to take you seriously because it was so shocking. Exactly. They probably thought you weren't serious. Exactly. But you were deadly serious. But, yeah. It's probably <laughs> frustrating too, but uh, I wanted to talk about sort of lyrics and philosophy and the delivery of those, those ideas. You know, like you said that now they know that I was born into that. So I learned all that as a kid. I, it was just like going to school in a way. I mean, my grandfather, my great grandfather had a huge library in this big mansion. And he said I could, um, you know, read everything except for what was on the top shelf. And of course, you know what I did as soon as he turned his back, <laughs> I, went, I went to that top shelf and stuff was written by in hand. You know what I'm saying? In ink, it wasn't printed. It was mm. like, and so I became very fascinated with, with what was going on. And not only that, it was, um, I thought it was normal. I thought it was all normal. And the philosophy was definitely um, left-hand path. It's not really what people think is satanic. Um, left-hand path more has a Satan or a Lucifer or uh, something like that that is more like a mascot. Um, it's because left-hand path believes that that's a Christian Thing, you know, that was made up by Christians that there's a God and Lucifer, but it's more like the power of the person and um, there's spells and things that do get you to certain places. Uh, also, there's a lot more to it than that. <laughs> I mean, um, anything in particular or like... No, I, I think there's a... It's huge. It's yeah. a huge mental thing. Um, and I am... I am partially sensitive. I'm not a medium, but I am a sensitive. And I think sometimes the people that are that do tend to go to that. And then that's part of their life. So, um, I would say that was kind of the philosophy too, that they, um, uh, try to tell you that in my, in my experience, um, I found that there are other things around, and a lot of people, some people laugh at me and some people go, oh, yeah, I've experienced that. But I've seen a lot of things that not on television shows, they're not at movies. It's pretty strange. And I don't know whether I should say anything about them or write them in the book. Some of them are written in the book. Um, and the philosophy is that don't think that you know everything that's going on pretty much, you know, and it's it's the earth, respect the earth, you know, and um I think it's a pretty good path. I I don't know why everybody's like fighting it, you know, like these religions. I I I don't know. I don't I don't understand it. But see, if you come from that, then that's where your head is at, as opposed to you know a, a Christian kid growing up or a Muslim or whatever. Well, I think if you grow up in a certain culture and things are ingrained in you, it's hard to get them out. You have that fear drilled into you from a very early age. I think little children probably shouldn't go to church at all of any kind. Oh, I agree. It's really totally. bad for them. They don't Good get it. Good point. And yeah. It's very, you know, scares them. It's it's easy for a family to indoctrinate their children. I know that's how it's done, but it's I think it's probably negative. It's, it's so bad. It is Not so bad. Thing. And I know they do the thing 
um, you know, it's like the kid grandma is in heaven, you know, and it, a lot of it's about death. Why are they so into this death thing? To me, the religions are into death and we embrace death. So we're not afraid of any of that. We're not afraid of changing, you know, because it is a change, you know, it's a transfer. And, um, we also feel that we, we are still in the situation some way, you know what I mean? So, I don't know. Look into it, you know? <laughs> Indeed. There's more out there. Uh, one last point on this uh, that I did want to talk about. There's, I think, a very – another subtle thing about lyrics and the message of Coven and the message of Jinx, which is uh, empowerment. I think it's a lot of personal freedom exactly. without impinging or hurting anyone else. Do without Ex wilt. Exactly. Doesn't mean be a dick to other exactly. people. Exactly. Thank and, you. And um, I think there's Good a point. very – almost very punk rock PMA, positive mental attitude – that you push out. And I don't know if it was just being a woman in the business and uh, it's not strictly feminist, although it's very feminist at the same time. But I think it's very, you know, it's fascinating to me that you kind of had to, you know, push this self-determination to get this band that everybody was against out to get yourself respected and understood. It took a long time and you continue to kind of espouse this philosophy and you still do, which is amazing. Right. Well, like I said, I just, it was my path. So, you know, a lot of people do know their path directly, what they're supposed to do, and they go down that path. And whether there's obstacles, they still keep going. Right on. And then uh, to jump ahead a little bit, a little further in time, a little time travel virtually, uh, I love that, you know, you sort of the band reactivated. There was interest in the band. It could have been the internet, could have been streaming, could have been Napster or uh, LimeWire or something that people started to discover these lost records that were a little bit lost to antiquity. There've been compilations, uh, a lot of dubs, a lot of one track is on a compilation of other occult rock. Again, uh, I don't mind that phrase. I don't want to offend. Some people do mind it. Um, I just think of everything as heavy metal myself, mm -hmm. but um, you know, you form your own record label, very DIY, very organized, very like I'm there's interest in this and I'm going to put this back out. What, you know, this is also a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work to be a soul enterprise and do this. I don't think people appreciate it how it is to sort of resuscitate a brand it like is. yours. It is. And so I'm really, I'm, I'm really <laughs> glad that you, you know, sort of putting out your own records indeed. And, uh, I love the, uh, the song from a few years ago that was sort of the unreleased jam that was great. Maybe not quite in this vein of all the other music, but I like right. the bravery to put out this, you know, sort of track, a uh, standalone, uh, you know, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, is there other lost material? Would there be, you know, I, I'm sure there's gotta be some other stuff out there that we've never heard. I don't know. I think that, um, Matt Bacon pretty much found all the lost stuff. Oh, okay. <clears throat> hey, Matt Bacon yeah. might know about it. <laughs> yeah, I think. Good. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a box set that's going to be released, and it's got a lot of secret stuff on there. Ooh, secret stuff. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. We've heard rumors. Yep, that's happening. But remember, don't try the spells necessarily because you don't know where the blinds are. Blinds are put in by a magus in order that somebody won't hurt themselves, because usually somebody, you know, learning about it and and uh, beyond a certain part of a neo being a neophyte, they know where the blinds are and they can figure out where they are. And that's like a trick, you know, like a trick that, you know, mm. if you say light this candle on what day and that if it's the wrong one, that the person, the whole thing doesn't happen. Mm. So they call that a blind. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, people need spirit guides sometimes. They can't do it themselves. Right. That's they need true. A, a, that's true. path or an intuit to help them succeed that's true get further work those spells a spell master a spell master it is it all is. about magic at the end of the day it is it really it is, is. And, and life is magic so i mean think about it it's chemistry which is magic so there you go alchemy maybe this is the problem is that we're always trying to fit ourselves into these very neat little boxes and life is messy and crazy and chaotic it is it's exactly chaos and that's chaos. why we call our our tours every single year has been the magical chaos tour and everybody's like why do you call it the same thing because it's magical chaos you know it's just a different year right and you just got done uh, on a huge magical chaos tour of europe yeah, it and was. Russia and uh, so Asia and Europe. Yeah, it, it was pretty, amazing. It, yeah, it I, was. I heard uh, I heard tales of uh, yeah. fantastic shows and yeah. uh, 
sold out crowds. And yeah, meetings. we were really pleased. It was really, really good. And places like Russia, we'd never been before, or Czech Republic, um, just amazing. I mean, they're they're chanting the band's name over and over at the end of the set. And you just like go, wow, how did they even really know about this? You know, and then down in Brazil, they'll be singing the words to wicked woman. And you'll be like, how do you know these, this, I, I it's really quite shocking. You know, it is to me. Well, that's a good kind of surprise. It is. It's, it is very good. Uh, I, I can say personally that I saw a coven at Roadburn and it was life affirming uh, when you came out of that coffin. Uh, so that's just me personally. <laughs> yeah, I like it when I come out too. My own. As long as I keep coming out of the coffin. Yeah. It's all really good. Keep coming out. We like it. Um, so we have uh, obviously tours and I know you have a big festival coming up in the fall. This box set is on the horizon. I would love to see you, uh, you know, someday write a book. I think, I think a well, lot of people it's would almost be into done. It. It's almost done. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's just that when you do that kind of thing, then you start picking over it and you want to have the exact f perfect phrase and artistic. And, and a lot of it is that way. Like the first part, the childhood part is so beautifully written. I mean, I'm sorry, I have to say that because I was impressed how beautifully written that you can see the whole picture of what was going on at this mansion that, you know, my great aunts had. And, and it was 18, like 1800 still there. And, um, um, uh, like I had a nanny and they were into Obia and hoodoo. And I mean, it was just like, wow, you know, for a kid, that kind of stuff wasn't scary to me. I was like, wow, this is really cool, you know? <laughs> and, um, so, you, but you just can't um, tell anyone that kind of thing. And I'm just really glad that I got that part down in the book and now I'm a little bit farther in. And it's so funny how it drastically changes, you know, like how this is the scene here and the vibe and then the vibe going to Chicago and then the vibe moving the band to L.A. Just so totally different, but always really interesting, you know, like really weird stories like that you haven't seen in a movie or heard in a book before. Now, a couple they've gotten, somebody, I keep watching like a movie and, you know, a couple of scenes are very similar to what had happened. And I keep going, geez, if I don't get this book out, <laughs> all this stuff is going to be known by somebody else having gone through this. Um, so I don't know. I guess I got to work on it, huh? <laughs> the Riot House in L.A., I have a feeling, is plays into this somehow. Oh, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> Hyatt House, Riot House. Yeah. Uh, you know, what I think is really interesting is through all those transitions is that you brought that your Southern Gothic upbringing has sort of, you know, permutated everything. And it, I think it that's... It did. It did. I think, you know, generally speaking, things like Americana have made a big resurgence also, as well mm -hmm. as this sort of doomy doom and gloom, heavy metal stuff. But right. I, I think it's interesting that people kind of don't associate those things as all interrelated. They're like very siloed, which is weird because we live in a time of Spotify and YouTube. Where right, exactly. We're not in a silo with our taste anymore. So, That's right. Uh, I think it was interesting. You were kind of curating that vibe even back then. Yeah, it does kind of just go with the whole thing. I don't know. I guess I'm lucky, you know. I mean, some people... They they pick something and maybe that's not the right thing for them. I mean, I didn't really pick it. It kind of was there. I mean, I could have I could have like gone against it. And mm. you know, my brother one of my one of my brothers did. Um, my father wasn't into it as much. Of course, he was a mason and he was into that part of it. Um, but he wasn't quite like my great aunts and my great grandfather. Um, but still, there were things that they had to do. You know that they couldn't you know do and they wouldn't do. You know. Um, but they just didn't get into it quite as much. And I, I just grabbed onto it immediately. I, well, for one thing, I was born on Friday the 13th. The doctor's name was Dr. Jinx. And, you know, so, so there you go. And they thought that it was something kind of special because the two great aunts had never been married or anything. They never had any children. So they kind of thought, Ooh, this is the one that's going to kind of carry on the, the legacy, I guess. And I kind of felt a bit of a burden, but it was an exciting burden. You know, it was very interesting. Mm. So that's kind of where it all was born. I didn't do any of this. You know what I mean? <laughs> it just happened to you. That's right. It was already there. You know, they already did it. So you're, you're just a vessel flowing exactly. through this. That's all I am. That's uh, all yeah. I am. I'm very, I'm very much looking forward to this book. And as we wind this down, I think, uh, I'm glad we talked a little bit about the book and, uh, I'm very interested I feel like you're so good at, uh, you know, social media and really preserving Coven and your own, uh, you know, whole 
history. And I think a lot of art, younger artists could probably learn a thing or two from you or how you manage your social media. And especially if you're about to put out a book that might be very revealing, warts and all perhaps, because yeah. uh, you mm -hmm. seem very free about talking about that stuff, although we didn't focus on that here. I think it's very interesting that uh, I think it'll, it'll be uh, helpful to you how you are perspective on on the media is it's going to you know continue to help protect you rather than go against you right well not only that the 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 times i i always include what's going on in the world you know during these dates and times and it's kind of like a historic kind of a thing too where you can see changes in in um, society and it's, it's kind of interesting so i hope i can add to the story in some way and i know it will so you know, the Chicago riots, that kind of thing, what was going on out in L.A., the Manson murders. I mean, in some odd way, there was a small thread with all of this stuff, you know, and it's in the book that how that does happen. So, Awesome. Looking forward to it. Uh, I definitely think that there's a, a sort of recurring thread that keeps coming back over and over again, that this stuff is the, the things you were talking about on the first Coven record still apply today, mm -hmm. very powerful for today, very relevant. I think that's why people are now have caught up to the band and really, you know, the, have the band on the pedestal that it deserves to be on you as well. And so uh, I look forward to this book and uh, box set and anything else you're working on future tours, hopefully another tour of the U S. Oh, hope so. Yeah. I hope so. Back in South America. And of course, always back to Europe. We love it there too. Awesome. Well, we'd love to have you back. Uh, Thank you so much for spending some time with us. I am Keefe from GhostcoldMag.com. This is the incomparable Jinx Dawson. Thank you so much for spending thank some you time with us. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. We'll shake it out. Yes. Appreciate you. you. Hails and kiss the goat. Hails and be well. Kiss the goat.